We shall begin this module by discussing about fiscal policy. Fiscal policy deals with the taxation and expenditure decision of the government. It refers to the changes in government expenditure and revenue to influence the level and pattern of economic activity. The Indian constitution provides the overreaching framework for the country's fiscal policy. India has a federal form of government with taxing powers and spending responsibilities being divided between the central and the state governments as well as a third tier of government at the local level. But the taxing abilities of the state do not necessarily commensurate with their spending responsibilities. Some of the center's revenues need to be assigned to the state government on the basis of the recommendations of the Finance Commission every five years. The constitution also provides that for every financial year, the government shall place before the legislature a statement of its proposed taxing and spending provisions for legislative debate and approval. This is referred to as budget. The central and the state governments each have their own budgets. Besides the annual budgetary process, since 1950, India has followed a system of five-year plans for enduring long-term economic objectives. The main fiscal impact of the planning process is the division of expenditures into plan and non-plan components. The plan components relate to items dealing with long-term socio-economic goals and often relate to specific schemes and projects. These are usually routed through central ministries to the state governments for achieving certain desired objectives. On the other hand, the non-plan expenditure broadly relate to routine expenditure of the government for administration, salaries and the like. Taxes are the main source of government revenues. These can be direct as well as indirect, which can be collected at central, state as well as local levels. After studying this module, you shall be able to know about the instruments of fiscal policy in India, examine the trends in deficits and debts in India, understand the various indicators of measuring deficit in India, understand the changes in the value of indicators of debt in India, and examine the debt sustainability at the state levels in India. Let us now discuss the instruments of fiscal policy in India. Fiscal policy is an important constituent of the overall economic framework of a country and is therefore intimately linked with its general economic policy strategy. The main instruments of the fiscal policy include tax policy, expenditure policy, investment or disinvestment strategies and debt or surplus management. The taxes are the main sources of government revenues. These can be direct taxes or indirect taxes. The direct taxes in India includes taxes on personal and corporate incomes, personal wealth and professionals are direct taxes. In India, the main direct tax at the central level are the personal and corporate income tax levied through the Income Tax Act of 1961. Income taxes are levied on incomes from business and profession salaries, house property, gains, capital gains and other sources like interest and dividends. Other direct taxes include the wealth tax and the securities transaction tax, estate duty, gift tax, expenditure tax, fringe benefit tax, etc. Some of these taxes like the estate duty, fringe benefits, etc. no longer exist currently. The state governments are vested with the power to tax agricultural income, land and buildings, sale of goods other than interstate and excise on alcohol. Some states charge a tax on professionals. Most local governments also charge property owners a tax on land and buildings. The indirect taxes are charged and collected from persons other than those who finally end up paying the tax. The current central level indirect taxes are the central excise duty, the service tax, the custom duty and the central sales tax on interstate sale of goods. The main state level indirect tax is the post manufacturing sales tax that is the value added tax. Similarly, on expenditure side, both the plan and non-plan expenditures are divided among the central, state and the local governments. The central government is responsible for issues that usually concerns the country as a whole like national defense, foreign policy, railways, national highways, shipping, airways, post and telegraphs, foreign trade and banking. Whereas the state governments are responsible for the other items including law and order, agriculture, fisheries, water supply and irrigation and public health. Some items for which responsibility vested in both the center and the state includes forest, economic and social planning, education, trade unions and industrial disputes, price control and electricity. There is now increasing devolution of some powers to local governments at the city, town and village levels. Moving on to discuss the deficits and the debt in India.
In any developing economy, the responsibilities of the government are always higher than the resources they can use for this purpose. This results into fiscal deficit. Like any developing economy, India too has a long history of running huge fiscal deficits. A higher fiscal deficit can be financed through domestic borrowings and external borrowings or by printing money. Excessive domestic borrowing can put upward pressures on interest rates, while external borrowings may result in an external debt crisis. Printing money would invariably lead to high inflation. The relationship among fiscal deficit, debt and output growth and other macro targets is a much debated issue. The traditional view states that high fiscal deficits created through higher public investment may displace private investment or more generally expenditure. According to this argument, public investment driven fiscal deficits crowds out the private investment through an increase in the interest rate which in turn discourages private investment and overall economic activity in a closed economy. However, the proponents of Keynes propagate the idea that high fiscal deficits are not unusual for developing economies as governments use fiscal deficits to keep aggregate domestic demand at high levels in order to generate growth and employment. High fiscal deficits accelerate capital accumulation and growth. They argue that an increase in fiscal deficit due to public sector investment, especially in infrastructure, stimulates growth in the private sector. This is generally referred to as the positive crowding in impact of the fiscal deficit. In Indian context, it is important here to quote the RBI study of 2001, which shows that an attempt to raise public consumption to revive aggregate demand will crowd out both private consumption and private investment with no long run positive impact on output growth. This study found that public investment in manufacturing appears to adversely affect the private investment. However, government expenditure on infrastructure crowds in the private investment. However, RBI analysts agree that excessive government consumption expenditure has a negative impact on growth. Therefore, it must be curtailed. Thus, in the case of India, fiscal imbalances have remained a cause for concern in the recent years. Despite impressive increases in the revenue productivity from direct taxes, there is a fear that fiscal imbalances will worsen, causing interest rates to harden and crowd out the private investment. Thus, the concern have been voiced about controlling the public spending and fiscal deficit. On the one hand, the government has to raise the public spending to boost the economy and on the other hand, the fiscal deficit has to be controlled in order to avoid its ill effects. In this context, we can examine the change in deficits and debts in India over a period of time. Now we will discuss the indicators of deficit. At the beginning of 80s, the combined gross fiscal deficit of the centre and the state was about 6%, which however increased to about 9% in 1990-91 and was almost the same in 2000-2001. This can be observed from the table. The table shows that during the last five years, the combined fiscal deficit of the centre as well as the state has remained close to 7%. Actually, during 80s, Along with the high external borrowings, a sustained increase in the combined revenue expenditure to stimulate demand, particularly in the service sector, caused the fiscal deficits to rise. This led to accumulation of debt at the unprecedented level accounting for a large portion of the government revenue expenditure and creating a debt trap in 1980s. During the first half of the 1980s, these revenue expenditures averaged 18.5% of the GDP. In the second half, they rose to an average of 22.4% with the bulk of the expansion coming under the heads of defence, interest payments, higher salaries and subsidies. A sharp increase in the government salaries and pensions in the next year halted the process of fiscal improvement until 2003-2004 when the government introduced the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act to control the fiscal deficit. According to this act, the government of India is required to bring down its revenue deficit by 0.5% of GDP each year until it touched zero and to reduce its fiscal deficit by 0.3% each year to level of 3% of GDP. However, there is a lot of disagreement among policymakers about targeting a zero revenue deficit in India for the reason that it sounds unrealistic to achieve these targets without affecting the growth process. For a developing country, it is more desirable to target a small revenue surplus to finance capital formation climbed from 4.1% of the GDP in 1990-91 to 3.2% in 2010-11 but rose steadily to 4.1% in 2011-12.
In 2014-15, it declined to 2.6% of the GDP. However, the primary deficit is threatening debt sustainability in the country. Let us now discuss about the indicators of public debt in India. The trends in fiscal deficit are also matched with the rising public debt levels. This can be observed from the table. The table shows that the combined debt of the central and the state governments, which averaged 56% of the GDP in 1980s, rose to about 63% into 1990 and climbed further to 71% in 2000-2001. A notable feature was the drastic reduction in the share of the external liabilities to GDP from 6.7% in 1980s to 3.1% in 2000-2001 and 2.9% in 2014-15. Actually, after the introduction of the FRBM Act, Public debt in India had shown trends of steady decline, but in the post-crisis period, that is after 2008 and 9, there was a reversal of this trend. In 2014-15, though the total public debt is less than the average of 90s, but it is higher than the registered in 2010 and 11. We can see from the table that the total public debt in India increased from 65.5% of GDP in 2010-11 to 67% in 2014-15. The fluctuations are much wild actually between 2000-2001 and 2010-11. These trends also point to one of the main deficiencies in the FRBM Act, namely the failure to set a cap on the public debt. There is little doubt that the FRBM Act put the country on a higher growth trajectory by reducing the fiscal and primary deficits, but a second fiscal system also needs to have in place measure to control the debt to GDP ratio. The rise in public debt can be attributed to sharp rise in the primary deficit. Principally, the ratio of debt to GDP will keep rising if there is a primary deficit or if the interest rate on debt exceeds the growth rate of GDP. As after financial crisis, the growth of GDP has slowed down, there are greater concerns regarding the sustainability of such high levels of public debt. Following the austerity measures to get an early exit from the high fiscal deficit regime and following the principles of fiscal responsibility are highly propagated. However, there is little consensus on the ideal debt to GDP ratio for the economy. Internationally, the Maastricht Treaty has set the tolerable debt level at around 60% of GDP for the European Union countries. The 12th Finance Commission had recommended an even lower target of 56% over a period for India. The budget 2015-16 was presented as the first year of the 14th Finance Commission. This Finance Commission has recommended an increase in state's share in gross tax revenue from 32% to 42%, which means greater resources with the states. Apart from containing growth in expenditure, the reduction in fiscal deficit is planned to be achieved in conjunction with targeted revenue augmentation, both through tax and non-tax revenues. Despite the growth rate improving in the current financial year, easing of inflation implied lower growth in nominal terms. Thus, tax revenues continued to be lower than the budgeted level. Given the resource constraint under low tax to GDP ratio, only option to raise additional resource remains through borrowing. In India, debt policy is driven by the principle of gradual reduction of public debt to GDP ratio so as to further reduce debt servicing risk and create fiscal space for developmental expenditure. Indian debt profile is characterized by reliance on domestic market borrowing with market determined rates rather than administered rates. Pursuing with government's commitment to carry on with the fiscal consolidation measures, the fiscal deficit for 2015-16 is budgeted to decline to 3.9% of the GDP. Total borrowings requirement for 2015-16 has been budgeted at Rs 5,55,649 crores. Net market borrowing, which is adjusted for repurchases or switches in 2015-16 of Rs 4,56,405 crores has been budgeted to finance 82.1% of the gross fiscal deficit. The net market borrowing projection shows an increase of 2.1% over the previous year. In terms of GDP, however, net market borrowings are budgeted to decline to 3.2% as compared with 3.5% in the previous years. Moving on to discuss the debt sustainability at state level in India. The attempts of fiscal consolidation at the centre also affect the fiscal situation at the state level. However, the growing economies need increasing public expenditure at the state as well as the central level. If the expenditure requirements of the state fall short of their own revenue receipts and intergovernmental transfers from the central government, then the states too have to rely upon the borrowing to meet their socio-economic targets. 
In India, the state governments often resort to borrowings to meet various development needs. The debt position of the state government in India, which deteriorated sharply between 1977-98 and 2003-04, has witnessed significant improvement since 2004 and 5, reflecting the impact of both favorable macroeconomic conditions and policy efforts by the central and the state governments. Despite the improvements in the debt position of the state government in India in the last decade, the recent growth slowdown and volatility in the financial markets have raised fresh concerns about their financial health. Actually, the state government finances in India have exhibited signs of fiscal stress after the mid-80s. This can be observed from the table. The table shows that the average debt to GDP ratio of all the states has increased from 18.3% for the period 1980-81 to 20.8% during the period 1992-93 to 1996-97. To to the period from 97-98 to 2003-2004 witnessed a sharp increase in this ratio and reached at 26.9%. But it declined to 26.4% during the period 2004-05 to 2012-13. We can also observe that the special category states have much higher debt to GDP ratio and it has been increasing ever since the period 1992-93 to 1996-97. At the disaggregated level, the states of Punjab, Bihar, West Bengal and Uttar Pradesh are the states having very high debt to GSDP ratio. For Punjab, it was 37.6% in 2013-14, while for the rest of the state, it was more than 40%. Traditionally, the assessment of the debt sustainability is generally done in terms of credit worthiness and the liquidity status of the economy. For this purpose, the debt and the debt service indicators are monitored to access the existing debt as the ratio of various fiscal balances. In addition, debt sustainability is also associated with a non-financial dimension about the capacity to plan, organize and implement policies which may be both budget and debt related. Improvements in fiscal conditions creates fiscal space and enhances debt repayment capacity, while worsening of fiscal conditions entails higher borrowings, adding to the debt burden. Some of these indicators are explained here in Table 4. The table gives an overview of the fiscal situation of the state of India for the period 1980-81 to 2012-13. We can see from this table that the total expenditure of the states during the period 1980-81 to 2012-13 had been higher than the total non-debt receipts. It has been 14.47% of the GDP as compared to 11.60% for the total receipts, leading to a gross fiscal deficit of 2.87% of GDP. However, the primary deficit was 1.15% of the GDP during this period. Actually, the sustainability of debt can be gauged on the basis of six main indicators. These are, first, rate of growth of the debt should be lower than the rate of the growth of the nominal GDP. Second, rate of growth of debt should be lower than effective interest rate. Third, real rate of interest should be lower than the real output growth. Fourth, primary balance as well as primary revenue balance should be in surplus. Fifth, revenue receipts as percentage of GDP should increase over time, but the revenue variability, debt to revenue receipts ratio, debt to tax revenue ratio and debt to own tax revenue ratio should decline over time. And sixth, interest payments as percent of GDP revenue expenditure as well as revenue expenditure should decline over time. In this respect, the RBI study by CORE etc. 2014 has analyzed the debt sustainability of the states over four phases with phase 1 from 1981-82 to 1991-92, phase 2 from 1992-93 to 1996-97, phase 3 1997-98 to 2003 and 4, and phase 4 2004-5 to 2012-13. This study revealed that the rate of growth of debt of the states at the aggregate level exceeded the nominal GDP growth rate during phase 1 and phase 3. However, the real rate of interest on debt remained lower than the real output growth in all the phases except in phase 3 when it was almost equal to the real output growth. The strain on the state finances in phase 3 was reflected in deterioration in all the indicators of sustainability with a sharp rise noticed in debt service burden. It was also indicated that the primary balance ratio was negative in all the phases, while primary revenue balance ratio deteriorated sharply in phase 3, but improved slightly in phase 4. The improvement in various debt sustainability indicators in phase 4 was driven by fiscal correction measures undertaken by the state governments, debt restructuring initiatives of the central government based on the recommendations of the 12th Finance Commission, along with the favorable interest rate environment. 
Interest payments which had crossed one-fifth of the revenue receipts during phase 3 declined to around 16% in phase 4. However, the debt repayment capacity and interest burden indicator in phase 4 lagged behind their respective performance levels achieved in phase 1. The positive gap between the rate of growth of GDP and effective interest rate in all the phases except phase 3 turned out to be a predominant factor that influenced the movement to debt GDP ratio during the period under review. It may be seen that the most of the states have met two of the debt sustainability conditions during the latest phase, that is phase 4. Similarly, the rate of growth of GSDP is higher than the effective interest rate in all the states. However, the third condition, that is the rate of growth of public debt, should be lower than effective interest rate is met by only two states, with Bihar and Odisha. On the basis of these results, this RBI study argues that while most of the debt sustainability indicators showed significant improvements during 2004-05 to 2012-13 compared to the earlier phase, debt repayment capacity and interest burden indicators lagged behind their respective performance levels achieved during 1981-82 to 1991-92. Let us now recapitulate or summarize what we have learnt in this module. India as a federal form of government and therefore the responsibilities and rights are also shared between the centre state and other levels of the polity and administration. This is also true for fiscal management of the country. The central government is responsible for the issues that usually concern the country as a whole like national defence, foreign policy, railways, national highways, shipping, airways, post and telegraph, foreign trade and banking. The state governments are responsible for other items including law and order, agriculture, fisheries, water supply, irrigation and public health. Like any developing economy, India too has a long history of running huge fiscal deficits. The relationship among fiscal deficit debt and output growth and other macro target is a much debated issue. However, the proponents of Keynes propagated the idea that high fiscal deficits are not unusual for developing economies as governments use fiscal deficits to keep aggregate domestic demand at high levels in order to generate growth and employment. But lately the government of India is trying to control the fiscal deficit and the debt under the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act. This has led to improvements in fiscal indicators in the recent time period. Same can be observed at the state level. At the state level, it has been found that while most of the debt sustainability indicators have shown significant improvements in the latest phase, as compared to 1980s and 90s, the debt repayment capacity and interest burden indicators still lag behind as compared to their positions in earlier time periods. Still, the fiscal position of India can be stated to be moving on the path of improvement.